So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be a Christian? And I like the term follower of Jesus perhaps a little bit better than the term Christian, though Christian is a good word. But so often we have this idea that Christian is kind of a vanilla type thing. Uh, Whatever you do is okay um, because of certain things that may have happened in the past. Some people think that they are Christians uh, because they have uh, family members who are Christians. And maybe you've had that conversation with someone at some point in time, you know, are, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I had a grandfather who pastored a church, and I had a grandmother who earned, you know, a 100% attendance award in Sunday school for her many years. Others think that they are Christian if they were baptized, maybe baptized as, a, as an adult or even as, a, as an infant, that they are a Christian because of baptism that has taken place. Others think that they are a Christian if they go to church. Well, you know, I, I show up in church or, or I'm an American and we realize that just because someone shows up in church does not mean that they are a Christian, that they are a follower of Jesus. I have been tracking the church mouse in my office, and it has been leaving remembrances for me that it is still here, and I can assure you it is not a Christian. (laughs) And so just because you're in church does not make you a Christian. So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? There are different ways in which that is described within the Bible and And this morning, we're going to look at a specific passage that identifies for us what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't mean that we are perfect. It doesn't mean that we have achieved a certain level of uh, of good living in our lives. It has nothing to do with that. We're still going to stumble and we are still going to fall. But we we have this direction in life. We have this purpose that we have have decided to follow Jesus, that we have become a follower of uh, of Jesus. And so that we have placed our faith and trust in Christ. We understand that we, we are sinners in need of a Savior, that we can't earn our way before God. And so we, we have placed our, our trust in Christ, and we are seeking to follow Jesus in our lives. And so the question is then, is asked, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? And so in a specific passage that we're going to be looking at together, Jesus makes it very plain for us what it means to be a follower of Jesus what it means to be a Christian. And and that call to be a Christian centers on the cross. It centers on the cross, hence the significance of the cross or the centrality of the cross. And we need to understand what that means, what the cross means. We often find the cross uh, in multiple places within a church. You know, we We have one up front, and sometimes we have one that's kind of movable, and and you'll find different places in which a cross is represented. Sometimes it's on on printed material, literature that is handed out. Some individuals wear crosses around their neck. It becomes a a piece of uh, of something that they do, And, and again, it can be that we look at a cross and it just becomes mundane. Or the jewelry that we wear can become mundane, but for others it isn't. They need to be reminded of the significance of the cross. And there are those who do wear a cross or maybe even have some other form of jewelry that indicates, I want to be reminded of what the cross is all about. And this morning, as we think in terms, we don't want the cross to be just a religious symbol. We want to understand what it means for Christ and what it means for us. It is, it is not a good luck charm. I've had individuals who tell me, I've, you know, I hang a cross from the rear view mirror of my vehicle and you know, so far it's kept me out of an accident. It's like, well, that's not really the purpose of the cross. There are those who are offended at the cross. When they see the cross, they, they find that to be very, very offensive. I don't know if you recall, quite a few years ago, there was a, a school building that was built within our community and uh, some people wrote into the, you know, the Herald Mail. They were offended because it appeared like there were crosses on this uh, public uh, building that had been placed there. And they found that to be very, very offensive. To be a true follower of Jesus, we need to understand what the cross is all about. 
And it's, even as a follower of Jesus, we can become desensitized. And so it's important for us to consider what is the significance of the cross. In fact, that's the reason why we practiced last week, as Jesus has commanded us to do, the communion service that focuses on the cross and the benefits of the cross past, present, and future. And so this morning, we are going to be reminded of the necessity of the cross because Jesus indicates that for us. And so I invite you to grab a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 16. We'll be going from verse 21 through verse 27. 21 through 27. If you want to follow along in a Bible that's maybe in the chair rack in front of you, it's page 976, page 976. First of all, we're going to see the necessity of the cross. As Jesus tells us why this is absolutely necessary for us. And we see that in verses 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things uh, among the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. He began to show, and what that means is he's he's showing his disciples in a much deeper way. He's becoming much more clear. So far, we've had some hints. Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm, I'm headed to the cross. And you recall in a couple of places in Matthew, Jesus, when, when the, the religious leaders said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, you don't get any sign other than the sign of Jonah, which was the fact that Jesus was going to be in the grave and he was going to rise again. But it was a hint. It was a hint. In John chapter, I think it's about chapter 2, Jesus, you know, they look, they, his disciples go out and they look at this beautiful temple. I mean, it was gorgeous. And, and as they're looking at Herod's temple, and then they see the sun reflecting off of it, and, and the disciples are impressed with that building, and Jesus said, you know, destroy, destroy this temple, and in three days it will be rebuilt, rise again. A hint of the fact Jesus was talking about his body. He wasn't talking about this building. So there have been hints up until this point, but now Jesus becomes very, very clear of what his mission and his purpose is coming to earth. The reason why he came to live among us and why his, what his mission entailed. It's the reason he left heaven was to come to this earth and it was headed toward the cross. And so Jesus begins now to tell his disciples to make it clear. And this is the first statement where he gives clarity as to what awaits him in Jerusalem. And so we see there are four musts that we find in verse 21. That I must go to Jerusalem. I must go. I must go. It wasn't optional. I must go. And if you understand the timetable, remember the timetable is really significant. Uh, As we've read already in this, this verse, in this passage, that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders who never got along are getting along in their desires to eliminate Jesus. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to do it secretly. They, they wanted to eliminate Jesus kind of privately. They, they wanted to get rid of him. He was, he was giving difficulty to their, their understanding of Scripture. He was taking their place, they thought. And so they wanted to eliminate Jesus, and they wanted to do it quietly. They wanted to make sure that Jesus was eliminated in in, in a way that wasn't very public because Jesus had a lot of crowd support. They didn't really understand all that he meant. They loved the free food, and they loved being healed, and, you know, those were nice things. And they liked to hear him preach and teach because it was different from what they were used to. So the crowd was very supportive, and the religious leaders understood that, and so their thought was, I need to, we need to eliminate Jesus in, in a private way. But that was not God's plan. God's plan was that Jesus would head to Jerusalem and that he would be, he would be crucified during Passover for a number of reasons. First of all, because Jesus represented the Passover lamb that was uh, executed and killed all the way through the Old Testament. Once a year, the Passover was done, and, and the Passover lamb, and Jesus said, I am that lamb, and so he is going to be put to death during the time of the Passover. But there's another piece to that that is really significant. Thousands, tens of thousands of pilgrims would come to Jerusalem. That the death of Jesus, by God's plan, was to be a very public display when most of the people would see it as pilgrims. 
It wasn't that he was going to be put to death, you know, a little, little side event. We don't know what happened, just a, sort of an accident. And he just kind of died. That Jesus was going to be publicly crucified when most people could see it. And so Jesus said, I must go. This, this timetable is God's timetable. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a travesty of justice, though it was. This was part of the divine plan of God for you and me. So Jesus said, first of all, the first must, I, I must go. I've got to go. This is the reason why I was sent. And then he informs his disciples, I must suffer many things. And you recall the events of Thursday night and Friday, the scourging, the crown of thorns, and his back being laid bare and laid open with a whip. Suffer many things. By the way, the description doesn't go into great detail because we're not supposed to feel sympathetic to Jesus. That's not the reason that he died so that we would be sympathetic. Oh, what a cruel death. It was. But he wants us to see who he was. And so right here, Jesus said, I'm going to suffer many things. The third thing that Jesus said, I'm going to be killed. I must be killed. I must be killed. That is the reason why Jesus came. We'll pick it up a little bit later to understand why that had to happen. But Jesus said, I must be killed. This, this has been prophesied, predicted all the way through the Old Testament. I'm, I must be put to death. But notice the fourth must. What's the fourth must? It must be what? What's your text say? Raised again. Raised up on the third day. That's the Jonah piece. I'm going to be raised on the third day. I must be raised on the third day. Again, a number of reasons for that. Number one is to prove that, that what Jesus did on the cross, God was satisfied with. So Jesus, it's a passive statement. I'm going to be raised. God raised Jesus from the dead to demonstrate that God places his stamp of approval on what Jesus did on the cross. It is sufficient. It is finished. To tell us, die, it stands finished. What stands finished? God's plan of salvation from all eternity past. And you remember, we've had this before. To tell us, die, it's a perfect tense. It means from this point on, it stands finished. It stands finished. You and I can't add a single thing to our salvation. It stands finished. Why? Because of what Jesus did. And it was a shout of victory. It wasn't a whimper in death. And so Jesus must be raised from the dead to demonstrate that God is satisfied with what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. Jesus must be raised from the dead to prove that there is life after life. That when we stand at the graveside of a loved one who has died in Christ, that there's going to be a great reunion one day because of what Jesus has done. And there's going to be resurrected bodies one day because of what Jesus has done. He is the first of its kind. He's the prototype. Now, I don't mean experimental. He's the first of its kind of a resurrected, glorified body that one day we will have. Someone asked me, I've had this a number of times. Somebody asked me recently, well, how old do you think we'll be? I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. But we're not going to be disappointed. We're not going to be disappointed. And so the resurrection of Christ, I must be raised. It, if Jesus is still, and you remember we looked at it a few weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus' body is still in a grave in dusty Palestine, we are of most men most miserable. We're wasting our time here this morning. There is no hope beyond this life. And I'm lying to you, and Paul says, I'm, he's lying to you, and all of the disciples and followers of Jesus have lied to you. And then Paul goes on, but thanks be to God that it really did happen. He was, Jesus was seen by over 500 people at one time. It wasn't, it wasn't a hallucination. It, you know, it wasn't you know, some sort of everybody getting in the same mood. Let's, let's think positive thoughts that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, that, that's not it at all. They, they saw him, and, and we know that Thomas got to touch him. This is after his resurrection. This is a glorified body. This is real, folks. This isn't, this isn't ghost and mystical. And Jesus said, Thomas, come, come put your fingers in the holes in my hand and come see the side. We read that Jesus ate. He ate breakfast with his disciples. He prepared it there on the bank. 
And they came in from fishing and said, here's bread. Let's, let's eat this together. It's, a, it, it, it's, it, it's real. The body is real. It's not a ghost. It's not make-believe. It's not pretend. So Jesus said, it must, I must rise from the dead to prove that what I have taught you is true and to demonstrate that there is a glorified body. And all you have to do, by the way, when Peter in Acts 2 stands up and preaches that Jesus has been raised from the dead, Peter, you know, if you don't believe that there is a resurrection of the body, you know, the tomb's only a few miles away. Go take a look. It's not like you got to take some big, you know, get on a train and a boat and an airplane and something to go off to some little island to see if that's where Jesus' body still is. It's like, no, it's right here. The tomb, but the tomb is empty. So Jesus said, this is my mission. This is my mission. I must be killed and I must rise again. So then we ask the question, well, why is it necessary? Why did Jesus need to die? Because of human sin and failure for which there must be a penalty that is paid. We, we have this idea that that, you know, it's not a big deal. Well, there, there's human sin and failure. None of us are, are good enough to get into God's heaven. God demands perfection. That eliminates all of us. And, and, and we read, for example, in Hebrews chapter 9, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no payment for sin. You see, sin's a big deal. Sin is a big deal. Because we're sinners and not mistakers. It's not, well, I made a little mistake. No, we're sinners. And, and that's highly offensive. If you've had a conversation with an individual, you know, why, did, why is a cross necessary? Because we're sinners. And they say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not like them. I'm pretty good. I don't, I don't cheat on my spouse. And I, I, I try and conduct my business dealings well. And I try and be a good person in my community. And I do some things for you know, philanthropically, and I help out with some organizations, and I contribute money and all of those kinds of things. But, you know, look at this person over here doesn't do any of that. Paul tells us that, that God gave to us the Ten Commandments kind of as a mirror for us to look in and see, truly see ourselves. We don't get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. Nobody ever did. And if you recall... Uh, Jesus broke it down into just two commandments. So if we would say, you know, I find it offensive that you tell me that I, I need a Savior. Okay, let, let's look at this. Jesus said uh, the first commandment can be summarized. The first four can be summarized. And love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you do that? No. Now, if we're honest, no. No. I can get pretty selfish. And so can you. You know, in this whole deal, right? I don't love God all the time with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and neither do you. No one can. No one has. So we strike out on commandment number one that Jesus boiled down into that. So don't compare ourselves to individuals around us. Compare ourselves to God's standard. I don't love God with all of my heart, soul, and mind. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. He created us for that. To have this relationship with him, to know him, and to love him. It's so what happened in the garden when Adam and Eve, you know, God would come down and communicate. They, they would enjoy that fellowship. God, along, God got along fine without people from eternity past. But decided to give us the privilege to know him and to love him and to interact with him. That's why we're created in the image of God. So that we can have these communicable attributes. We can talk to God. We can have the conversations. So we strike out on number one. There is not one person alive or who has ever lived or who will live. Humanly, just to love God with all of their heart, soul, and mind, and strength. We strike out on number one. How about number two? Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm, do you do that? No, we don't. You know, we have this tendency to think, you know, our, we, we do something to a, a neighbor, and a neighbor isn't just the person living next door, all right? The, the, you know, Jesus used that terminology, anybody that's out there and about. So, so do we love the neighbor as ourselves? Do we love other people as we love ourselves? The answer is no. Well, you know, there are some times where, you know, that neighbor does some things to us and we're thinking, you know, what's wrong with them? 
Why'd they do that? Why'd they get ticked off? They need to chill. And then we do the exact same thing to them when we think, you know, why are they mad? You know? And, and, and so, you know, that's back and forth that goes, and we don't love our neighbors as ourselves. We, we need God. We need Christ. We need the work of the cross in our lives. And so the cross is offensive. In fact, it was predicted. You can go to Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 53, that says Messiah is going to come and he's going to die. And Jesus had all the qualifications, qualities, and signs to indicate he was who he claimed to be. And so Jesus now informs his, his 12. Remember, they were up in Caesarea Philippi, about as far away you could get from Jerusalem to have some time so that Jesus could focus on teaching his disciples what was going to happen and why they were headed for Jerusalem. This is, this is the point in which Jesus turns his ministry and now heads to the cross. That's why we read, I must go. This is the reason he came. This is the reason for Christmas. This is why Jesus descended down into our world, so that he could head to the cross for your sin and mine. It's absolute necessity. It's the only way to deal with our sin and our failure. Well, Peter, having heard this very, very plainly, decides he's going to instruct Jesus. And so we read in verses 24 through 20, uh, uh, 23 and 24, where, where Peter rebukes Jesus. Notice what it says. And, and Peter, verse 22, took him aside, began to rebuke him. Uh, Jesus, come over here, man. I, I, I need to tell you something. Now, remember just previously when Peter was asked, who is Jesus? Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, well, some say, you know, and this, first of all, Jesus asked, so who do people say that I am? And so there's a number of responses, that, you know, some suggestions. And then, then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And I think it's Peter speaking for the rest of the disciples. Who, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are Messiah. You're exactly the one that God sent into this world. Right? You're, you're the one. So Peter's coming off this high. He just passed the exam, right? He passed, you know, passed the exam, flying colors. Others were, were joining with, in with him. He gets an A or A plus or extra credit if you want to, you know, count the, who do others say that I am. So he's coming off of that. And when Jesus informs him that I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm, I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again, and, and Peter pulls P, uh, Jesus to the side and, said, and rebukes him. That is a very, very, very strong word. Very strong word. It isn't, you know, you know maybe you need to rethink this. It's like, absolutely not. This will not happen to you. What's the problem? had the wrong idea of Messiah. We didn't really cover it last week, but if you go back to verse 20 of chapter 16, we'll cover it this week, okay? And, and, and notice, after, after Jesus has identified who he is, and we read this in verse 20, then he, Jesus, warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. You think, wait a minute, I, I thought we were supposed to tell people who Jesus is. Yeah, but they had the wrong idea of who Jesus was. That's why Jesus said, don't tell them because they don't, they don't understand yet. They thought that Messiah was going to come and overthrow Rome. They thought he was going to be a political deliverer, thought he was going to be an individual who would put food on their table that, that, that usher in a brand new um, era of Jewish and Israeli prosperity and get rid of all this other stuff, get rid of the Roman soldiers that were occupying their land. They, they had a wrong idea of who Jesus was. And so Jesus said, don't tell them who I am because they're going to have the wrong idea and want me on the, on the throne when I need to go to the cross. And the cross always comes before the crown. And so that's why Jesus tells them back there, and Peter still is wrestling with it. He still has in his mind, he's a, he's a Jewish individual. He was raised that way. And so in his mind, it's, it's still this Messiah. We want a ruling and a reigning Messiah. We're not interested in one who's going to die. 
In fact, some, some religious rabbis, when you get to like Isaiah 53 that speaks of a suffering Savior, they, they came up with the idea that, well, maybe there are two, two messiahs. One's a suffering messiah and one's a glorious messiah because the thought of resurrection never crossed their mind. That we could still have a suffering messiah who died but who's going to rise from the dead and therefore he could reign. And that's where Peter is stuck and... Notice what happens. So Peter says, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, and it's, it's as Peter is still speaking. It's the tense of the verbs. Peter is still speaking. And Jesus interrupts him and he rebukes Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. Man, that'll get your attention. Wait a minute. I just gave this great response of who Jesus is, right? And now he's identifying me as being part of Satan's work. Get thee behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Peter had become an instrument, a spokesman for, for Satan. Don't go to the cross. You, you see, that it, it's interesting if you watch, you know, that Satan attempts to thwart the plan of God ever since the fall when, when Satan fell from heaven and then, and then he tempts Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve was tempted. Adam knew what he was doing, the text tells us. He made a, a willful decision. And all the way through the Old Testament, God said that Messiah is going to come from the Jewish nation and, got, and, and Satan tried to sidetrack that, even starting with Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation. And, you know, Abraham messed up a few times, didn't he? You know, trying to help God and, and whatnot. It was, and it was Satan's plan working behind there. And all the way through, we see that. And, and we come up to this point where previously, you know, Satan tried to tempt Jesus. Pretty much the same thing. Don't go to the cross. Hey, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Just bow down and worship me. You won't have to go to the cross. We trace that through. Don't go to the cross. Don't go to the cross. And here's Peter. Don't go to the cross. Why is that significant? Well, if you've joined us on uh, Wednesday night in Genesis, in chapter 3, after the fall, Adam and Eve have fallen. Verse 15 is the first glimpse of the gospel that says that, uh, that Satan will bruise him, the seed, which I understand to be Jesus, on the heel. But at the cross, Christ, the seed, was going to crush the serpent's head. So the bruising of a heel, that's painful. If you know, if you've ever been working around in construction and, and you know, you stepped on a board that had a nail come through, it's like, oh, that's painful. And, you, you know, you limp around for a, for a few days and it, it's not fatal. But if something crushes you on the head, it's fatal. And it's at the cross in which Jesus crushed the plans of Satan who sought to lead people astray and has given to us the opportunity to be freed from the burden and the failures that we have. And so it was at the cross that, that Satan did bruise the heel of Jesus. It was painful. That's what Jesus meant by suffer many things and be killed. But it was a resurrection of Jesus Christ that crushed the head of Satan and ultimately sealed his doom. And so we see that. That's, that's why it's explained here. That's why Jesus said to him, Satan doesn't want me to go. You're a stone of stumbling. You're thinking human thoughts and not God's thoughts. Kind of reminds me, you know, sometimes who, who do we listen to at times, right? You know, some people who love us and care about us, but maybe they tell us to do something that really isn't what God would want us to do because, you know, hey, don't, don't go there. That, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be hard. Well, maybe that's what God wants you to do. And so here it is, Peter, Peter, Peter who loved Jesus gave him bad advice. Actually, it was more than advice. And so Jesus rebukes Peter. Get, the, get behind me, Satan. Satan is using you to seek to keep me from going to the cross. The cross wasn't easy. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus, it says of Jesus, he sweat 
great drops of blood. He had his disciples, who Jesus said to his disciples, you stay in prayer. It wasn't praying for Jesus, it was praying for them so that they wouldn't enter into temptation. And Jesus went off a little way and began this conversation with God, his Father, and he said, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, let's do it. But nevertheless, not my will but thine. There was no other way. Dear friends, in the plan of God, there was no other way for you and me to become part of God's family. There was no other way for you and me to have our sins forgiven. There was no other way for us to have an entrance into God's family other through than what Jesus did for you and me. There's no other way. And so Jesus turned and headed to the cross. No other way. He understood that. And Jesus willfully did that. So then how does that impact us? What difference does it make for us? What's, what's the call to discipleship when we read that in verses 24 through 27? That the call that, that Christ calls us to as disciples, as followers of Jesus, is costly. In fact, it's total commitment. You see, there aren't degrees of being a follower of Jesus. Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll choose grade A follower of Jesus. I know it's going to be really, really hard, and we're going to have to do a lot of stuff, you know, like, like SEAL team kind of stuff following Jesus, and, but I'm not interested in that. Let me, let me try B. You know, maybe the grade is down a little, not quite as taxing, but I, I, I like C. I, you know, I want to be average Christian. It's not an option. There are no grades of being a follower of Jesus. Either we're in or we're not. And so Jesus said, now let me help you understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That it's total commitment. And Jesus identifies for us four necessities of being a follower of Jesus in, in verse 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What's the first thing? Deny himself. You know what that means? It means I get myself off the throne and I put Jesus on the throne. That there's a point in time where I make the decision, the determination that I'm no longer, although, yeah, we keep having this tendency to go and grab, well, let me sit on it for just a little bit. I kind of like that, but, and, you know, Jesus, could you move just a little bit so I can have a little bit of, you know, at least a little control? And I'm like, no. You know, it's like that old song that, you know, Jesus take the wheel. Um, not necessarily found in Scripture, you might understand. But, but the idea is sometimes, you know, and I've seen those bumper stickers, right, that, that, that God is my co-pilot. God's not interested in being co-pilot. He's driver. You see, that means for us to get off the throne to put him in that place. And so Jesus said the first thing that it takes is to deny, deny ourselves and put Christ on the throne. Second thing is, notice what it says. What's the second thing in your text? What's it say? Do what? Take up what? Cross. In our day, that doesn't mean nearly as much as what it did in the day of Jesus. The Romans had uh, created a, a means by cruel and but not unusual punishment. There were tens of thousands who were crucified under Roman rule in Israel. And what the Romans had, would have individuals do would be to carry a cross beam on their way to the cross. They were going to be crucified. And people who looked at it and watched individuals carrying their, this beam knew they weren't coming back. It was a dead man walking. There, were no, there was no one who got off the cross alive. And so when Jesus says to us that our calling is to take up our cross this means we are living our lives for him, that we have committed our lives to him, that there's no turning back, friends. There's no turning back. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to put Christ on the throne. I must deny myself. I'm not living for Dan anymore. I'm not living for me anymore. I'm living for Christ. I must take up my cross. It's a very, very graphic term. Too often we think in terms of, yeah, my cross to bear is my nagging spouse. 
That's not it. Or, you know, I've got this physical infirmity that I really don't like, you know, and it just keeps bugging me, and so that's my cross to bear. No, that's not it. Taking up a cross is a willful decision. I will take up my cross. It's not one that's forced upon us. It's a one we choose to bear. And so it's a willful decision for Christ. And thirdly, notice what what Jesus said. Follow me. Follow me. It's interesting. The first two verbs are what they call aorist. means it's just a point in time. You know, I made this decision, although... Although, you know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which present your bodies, that's all of us, which is your reasonable service of worship. And someone has indicated the problem with the living sacrifice, which is us, is that we keep crawling off the altar, which is obviously true, all right? But, but the first two are like, there's a point in time that, that, that I've decided, made the decision to follow Jesus. I've denied myself I've, uh, and, 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 and I've taken up my cross but then this, this third one, follow me, is a present tense. I, I must be following Jesus. That means here and now. That means today. That means right now. Yeah, low battery. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, 1120, 1121 time, 929 date, I'm following Jesus. Tomorrow, I'm following Jesus. As I live out that day, I'm following Jesus. And your call to follow Jesus is different than, you know, I mean, there, there are basics of that, but, but you're, some of you are following Jesus at school. That's how you follow Jesus. Some of you are following Jesus in the business world. Some of you are following Jesus in other means, but that's your call, that as you live out your life, you follow Jesus because he now sits on the throne. And then there's a paradox that, that Jesus gives to us that, that we need to understand, verse 25, for whoever wishes, whoever, whoever wishes to save his life is going to lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will, will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's a paradox. You see, if I give up my life to follow Christ, I actually profit from it. Now, that doesn't mean I earn my way into heaven, it's not that at all, but that's the life of blessing that God gives to us. But if I choose to live for me and keep myself on the throne, I lose. I lose. And so do you. Gain life and forfeit life. We've seen movies about that, haven't you? Secular movies about that. You know, an individual who sells his soul to the devil or or books, or plays, or musicals, etc. What does it profit if he gains the whole world? What, what difference does it make if you gain all of the riches of this world, but you lose your life? He's talking about real life. You know, we're bombarded from time to time by individuals who have done really, really well financially. Uh, so-and-so has this $500 million yacht. And it costs $25 million a year in order for that yacht to be used. And we're thinking, isn't that amazing? Well, sometimes you deaden the pain through stuff. You pursue it. And what Jesus says here forfeits the soul. What does he mean? The real us, the real me, the real you. That which goes beyond this life, that which goes beyond the grave, that which makes us us, not just merely physical body. And, and, and the, the, it's not a threat. It's not a threat. What Jesus is saying here is it's an observation that we can watch individuals who live for this life only and they lose. Yeah, the $500 million, yeah, well, that's pretty big. That's pretty, that's pretty great. But, you know, what makes next? We've got to buy another one. We've got to do something bigger. And then, and then what happens? If we just fill our life with stuff, then somehow I find meaning and purpose. No, the more stuff we have, the more empty we are. Say, so prove that to me. All right, thank you for asking. Ecclesiastes. Solomon, the richest man who ever lived. 
the Jeff Bezos of his day. Right? Wisest man, most wealthy individual. And you read the book of Ecclesiastes, and somebody, I think, has, has titled the, the commentary, The Diary of a Desperate Journey. Here's a man who had reached the pinnacle of success in his life. And he said, I'm still empty. Now, he had known God as a young man. He'd been introduced to who God is and a relationship with God. He had that. But he had tried finding meaning and purpose. He's trying to solve the riddle of life. And so he tried intellectualism. You know, I did it by, by my brain. I, in fact, it says I, 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 used, I used my wine guiding me as I tried to figure it out. No, he didn't get drunk on it. He just, you know, trying to get a little pleasure, trying to figure it out. And he said, you know, that's not it. And, and then he said, you pleasure. He said, anything I wanted, I could have. Anything. Anything was at his disposal. And he said, you know, I'm still empty. Well, maybe if I get enough stuff, and he built monuments to himself, and he acquired all kinds of horses and chariots and all those things that were considered, you know, he had his stable full, he had his garage full of the latest, you know, uh, Bugattis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, you know, it's still empty. It's still empty life. And at the end of it, last chapter, he said, here, here it is. Love God, keep his commandments. Be a follower of God. That's what Jesus is saying. Pascal said uh, something very similar that God has placed within every human being a God-shaped vacuum, that there is something within us that desires to know who God is. I heard of a man, uh, I think it's true, that uh, he had put in his will that what he wanted at the, when he finally got, uh, died, that he wanted his ashes placed within, you know, like a little egg timer, you know, that hourglass kind of thing. And he said, I want you to give, uh, so his ashes were in this thing, is, is what his will said. And he said, I want you to give one of those to my banker, because he's taken all my money. And I want one of them to go to my IRS guy, because he's also taken all the rest of it. You know, he said, you know, they can just be reminded of me as it sits, uh, flip it over, and there he is again, you know, kind of thing. He's just, that I live for this stuff, but there's, there's no answer to it. And so Jesus said, the significance of the cross is, do we make the purpose of our life? And it doesn't end there. Let me, let me close with verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in glory of his Father with his angels and then recompense or repay every man according to his deeds. This is not earning salvation, but it's saying at the end of time, there's going to be a repayment. Every single human being stands before God. Those who know Christ and have trusted him, placed their faith and trust, would speak, Bible speaks of getting, you know, being rewarded for serving Christ with our life. We don't earn it, but it, it's God's gift. In fact, it speaks of crowns that are given to those who have followed Jesus. And it isn't the Western kind of mentality. Hey, you know, he's got seven crowns. I only have three. It says we're going to take those crowns. We're going to give them back to Jesus because he's the one who's made it possible. We're giving them all back to him. And the tragedy is to live our lives and not have anything to bring to Christ. And so that's what Jesus said. There's, there's this coming day when he's going to repay. It will be worth it, dear friends. The suffering and the hardship that we go through, we put Christ on the throne. The significance of the cross. What's the significance of the cross? That Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe to cancel a debt we couldn't pay. Every time you look at a cross, you should be reminded that Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe to cancel a debt we couldn't pay. Let me give it to you in a graphic form. You've been waiting for this, I know. So, so if we were to do, and by the way, you can share this with individuals. They ask, so, so what's the gospel? What's the gospel? Well, thank you for asking that question. The gospel is that Jesus... Yeah, try another one. The gospel is that Jesus came down from heaven. He came down to earth. That's Christmas. That's why Jesus came. He came down from heaven. That he went to the cross. And that's what we're seeing right now in Matthew chapter 16, that Jesus went to the cross. And then, and then he was buried in a tomb. He went to the tomb to pay... Because he was really dead. He went to the cross to pay for our sins and our failures. He went to the tomb because he was really dead. He, he didn't swoon. 
The executioners were really good at this. As I mentioned, nobody ever came back from the cross alive. And they looked and they saw that Jesus was dead. But then Jesus rose from the dead. And he's seen by many to prove that God is satisfied with what Jesus did. And what we just read in Matthew chapter 27 is that Jesus is coming back. And so Jesus is coming back. And, there, and, and so it's worth serving him. And so when you and I, what's our calling? To be followers of Jesus, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him. And the cross, every time we see the cross, should remind us that Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe so that he might cancel a debt we couldn't pay. The following Jesus is the most important decision you will ever make. It's the one that has the most value. You say, what's, you know, what, what's the worth of your soul? Some of, some of you here this morning might be thinking, yeah, that, that's, that's a nice story, but I've messed up too much. I don't know that I have value before God. Dear friend, you are so valuable to God that Jesus came and he died on a cross for you. That's your value. You're made in the image of God. You're valuable to God. And it means then as we live out our life before Christ that it makes a difference in how we live at home. In our marriage relationships, am I living for me or am I living for Christ? To represent to a world, Ephesians 5 tells us that our marriages represent to the world what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That in our parenting, we are living for Christ and that you as children respond to your parents because you want to serve Christ and that God has placed them over you. That in our daily decisions that we make, is it a matter that I'm living for Christ or is it a matter I'm living, I'm living for me? Some of you may remember lots of years ago, there used to be a uh, board game and it was entitled Life. Any of you remember that, Title Life? Yeah. Maybe you played it with your kids. It's kind of an interesting little game. You, you start off with your, you know, you, you choose a car color, and then, and then you put you, it's a little pin, a little stick in there, and then, and then as you begin to roll the dice and you begin to walk, walk through life, and uh, you come to a place that's like, yeah, I think I'll get married, and so you choose to get married, but that costs you. You know, money is, is then spent, and those of you who are married understand that happens. And then you move a little bit further, and then you have kids, and then that really costs you. And, but you, you keep going, and then you can, get an ed, you, know, you can choose to get an education. You can choose to get a certain uh, work in a certain industry or whatever, and depending upon what you choose. And then, then when you come to the end of the game, you're supposed to tally who has the most money, right? And the one who has earned the most money is the winner. But then it all goes back in the box. It all goes back in the box. And dear friends, when we live our life for Christ, there's something beyond the box. And so that's why we live our lives for Christ. Because there's something beyond that box that Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe to cancel a debt we couldn't pay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth and reality that we are, we are precious in your sight. That Jesus loved us so much as individuals, even when we mess up, even though we fail. But our goal and our desire is to be a follower of Jesus, just as Peter. Peter had some great high points and he had some low points, but his heart was to follow you. And Father, we often find ourselves there. And so I pray, God, in a very special way, maybe some who are really struggling this morning, to understand that you haven't reduced your love for that individual. You still love them, and that's why Jesus came. That, God, you love us, and so we seek to live for you. That the cross is central to our lives as followers of Jesus. It's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to follow Christ. And it's in the name of our Savior we pray.